Hey everyone, I'm Joy. And I'm Jason. And welcome to episode three of our podcast, Over the Hill. Over the Hill is a podcast about our journey to cycling fitness, having started riding five years ago and just getting coached for less than a year. We also have a YouTube channel called Join Jason Rides, which is a visual recap of our races and events. Sometimes we can't really go in depth with our experiences in our videos, so hopefully this podcast can fill the gap. In the last episode, we pretty much rambled on about our races and didn't really get to touch on the bonus segment. Hopefully we'll do a better job at that today. So sit tight and enjoy the episode. Last episode, as mentioned in the introduction, we did not get to talk about the tips for beginners since we did a lot of talking about our race recap. And so if you are new to cycling and you want to, you're hesitant in or reluctant to ride on the road, we could give you some pointers. And most of it is really just practicing riding on the road. And I I guess I'll give you a little backstory of how I started. Um, I had a friend who rode her bike from, I think it was from New Milford, Connecticut, to Glacial, Glacier National Park. Is that Wyoming? I believe so. So she was a part of this program called um, Bikes and Build. And what they do is they traveled from one location to the next, point A, point B, and they would build homes for help build homes for habitat and humanity and they would go again to the next location and I thought it was a really interesting experience that she had and so I actually sort of tapped her brain a little bit in asking her about road cycling and how to ride on the road since she's had multiple experiences with that. And so we found a location where she, I guess, rides often, and it's on Lake Warramug. And this, it's around the lake, six mile loop, and it's relatively flat and safe. There's not many cars there. And I started riding with her and she showed me the clipping in and clipping out. And it was funny because this was before I even knew how to adjust the tension on the, the pedals I didn't realize that there was one there's a setting where it really is hard to unclip and then there's a lower setting where it's easy to unclip and so I actually had mine on a high setting and so she said to loosen it up so that it's easier to unclip and so that made it a lot easier for me um, if she hadn't told me that uh, if she hadn't given me that suggestion of loosening the tension on the pedals so if you're hearing before we even move forward if you guys are hearing a lot of background noise that's because we're outside in our deck it's a beautiful evening we just had dinner and enjoying the nice cool breeze but that also means that there is a lot of noise in the neighborhood between cars and motorcycles. So I'm sorry for the background noise ahead of time. Uh, so anyway, going back to that story, um, she, we rode a couple of times and uh, she, as we were riding, she showed me where to ride on the road, um, you know, saying in, within the, uh, they had like a, I don't, I'm not say I'm not sure if it's a bike lane, but it's a, a wide enough lane where, you know, we could, we could ride on. Um, and you know, just the basics of using hand signals, if you are turning, um, and that's how, you know, I started riding on the road, just had a little bit more confidence after a few rides with her, um, just from, from doing that. Yeah, and then I learned a lot from riding with Joy because she started riding before I did, and she passed on some of that information that she learned from her friend, passed it on to me, 
And I think a lot of experienced cyclists are willing to share their um, their knowledge of the road with new cyclists. If you so if you if you happen to know when you're first getting into cycling, especially if you're getting into it because you know someone that's that's already into it, you know, just try to maybe first try to to tap their brain about um you know what they know about riding on the road and how to handle everything and uh if you can try to ride with someone that's go f- go out there for a ride with someone that's experienced and hopefully they'll be able to sort of show you the ropes um and i think it takes a lot of patience both in the person showing you how to ride on a road and yourself also because you're not going to get it right the first time around you have to really ride more often on the road to get an idea and an understanding of how the traffic flows and how to communicate with motorists and that's one big thing is that you know driving erat or riding erratically can and will tick off motorists. And, you know, we've had motorists honking at us, motorists who rode very close to us, but it's more of you have to just compose yourself before, you know, getting angry and reacting to it. And it really does help with your experience on the road if you're calm and you know if you're unsure you could always stop and let the let the traffic flow but there most of the time they will give you enough space i've never experienced being ridden off on the side of the road because for whatever reason you know so i we've i don't think we've ever experienced we've ridden we ride a lot together and I don't think we've ever experienced that, but we've had, we've had experiences where people rolled out their windows and yelled at us for, you for know, no reason. Yes. Yeah, Cause they're just, like stupid, uh, you know, just, they're imma- just angry people. Yeah. Just angry or immature people. Right. Um, you can't, but you see those kind of people throughout, you know, all walks of life. It's not just, um, there's a lot of people like that out there in general. So you you will encounter a few bad apples when you're riding. You know, you'll probably at some point have someone honking at you or yelling something at you for no reason, and even if you're not doing anything wrong. Um, so just because someone honks at you doesn't necessarily mean you're not riding correctly. Um, however, there are a few things that basic things that you can do to, you know, to minimize that, um, that type of encounter. Um, you know, for one, try to stay as far to the right as you can. Sometimes the shoulder, sometimes if, if you have a good shoulder, shoulder to ride on, then that's, that's ideal. Uh, if the road really doesn't have a shoulder or it's not, it's not rideable, you know, there are times when you have to, to, to be in the actual lane, um, but just try to stay as far to the right as you can. Um, you know, don't don't swerve into the middle of the lane. And the the and, big, go ahead. And just try to be as predictable as you can as a rider. You know, you don't want to be that person riding and there's a car behind you and they don't know what you're doing. You know, if you are making a left turn here, we, you know, we drive on the right side of the road, we ride on the right side of the road. If you're making a left turn, make eye contact with the driver or you don't have to make eye contact, but just look back so that they know that you can, see, you know that they're there. And if you have to make a left turn, I, what I do is I look back, I check on the, the car, they can see that I'm looking at them and I just point to the left to make a left turn. And you really have to use your senses also, you know, like here, sense of hearing is, 
I am all for listening to music. I, I used to never want to listen to music on the ride because for safety reasons. Um, but I don't think you should. I've, I haven't, you, you know, I, my first several years of riding, I did not listen to music at all because I was nervous about not being able to hear traffic. But now that I'm comfortable riding on the road, I have these open ear headphones or bone conduction headphones and they allow me to, to hear traffic and I can pause my music if I need to during an, at an inter intersection. And, you know, you just use your senses, use your sense of hearing. If you can hear that there's a car behind you, just look back and just slow down or just make sure that you are signaling if you're gonna make a left turn or sometimes even if you're gonna make a right turn because they don't know why you're slowing down. You know, they don't really know, you know, what you're thinking. And at the end of the day, all you have on is this helmet that's supposed to protect your brain and Lycra, you know, that's so that that's not really much of a protection for you. And people who are driving in cars, you know, they have this metal or whatever it's made of now that's they got the seat belt they got all sorts of things that could protect them from hitting a cyclist and so you're more likely to get hurt than they are at the end of the day and so you have to protect yourself you have to uh, ride defensively so that you're safe and it's going to take a lot of practice and it's going to take a lot of riding outdoors to be able to master that I, th I think you said it pretty well there. Yeah, I don't know um, other issues that people, I know a lot of people are afraid of, of, of riding on the road and just go with the traffic. Do not ride on the opposite lane. You know, some people run or walk in the opposite direction, um, but that's not, we're riding with traffic. I know that I've seen people ride in the opposite direction and it scares me and these are just I think people who didn't who, who don't really know what um the rules of the road are as a cyclist um so you know absolutely don't ride in the opposite of traffic because you know you're gonna get, get into a crazy head-on collision with a with a car and that's definitely not something you want to happen to yourself Yeah, so you want to, um, I don't really have much to add to that one. Okay. I mean, it really just comes down to, you have to get experience. The, the more that you ride on the road, the more, the better you'll get at, um, at dealing with various situations, um, smoothly, you know, without, eventually it'll become second nature to you, but it just takes a lot of practice. And try to find roads that are quiet if you're riding the first time around. Uh, quieter roads are, is a good practice because if you come across a stop sign, you know, practice unclipping uh, or a stop light, you know, practice crossing, you know, a clipping in when the, the light turns green so you don't feel stressed that there's a car behind you. So, you know, practice riding on quieter roads. I find that even though city roads are, you know, lot, there's lots of cars, I actually find them, um, if you're good at clip, clipping and unclipping, I find them to be uh, safer to ride in because the cars are not flying. Because if you're in a city, they're going to be, the cars aren't going to go as fast because they're stoplights. So, Yeah, just find a road that's either quiet. I mean, I wouldn't, I wouldn't for the first time ride in a city, but definitely find a quiet road. And if you can, if you are, you know, if you can find a group to ride with, ride with the group, because it is safer to ride with a bunch of people as opposed to by yourself, because motorists will see a clump of cyclists mm -hmm. as opposed to one person. They'll see them easier. Oh, forgot to mention lights. Right. So oh, yeah. this isn't really road etiquette, but, you know, you do want to be seen. 
Uh, I, you know, we're all motorists. I mean, I don't know if anybody, any of the listeners don't ever drive, but, you know, Jason and I both drive to work. And we understand that there are certain people that are really hard to see when you're when you're driving, especially on quiet back roads. And so you need to be seen. So make sure you have lights. You know, that's a sa- the safest way to 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 ride. Yeah. And if you're wondering, you know, what brand we use, we have a laser. Is it laser? No, that's our helmet. Is it? I, l- I forget the le- brand. Lezine or something? Oh, Lezine. Lezine. Yeah, Lezine lights. And we try to get the brightest one so that motor, you know, cars can see us or drivers can see us. So in addition to how to ride on a road, you know, you also probably are looking for shorts, for bib shorts. Yeah, so that's our next topic. And I have a, I have a few things to say about this one because... I I used to hate when I when we first started riding the bike, first few times we rode a bike together, riding the hybrid bikes, which you may have heard us talk about in our first episode. Uh I was very reluctant to even ride with bike shorts cuz I was like you know, I wasn't really a I wasn't actually a cyclist yet. I was just a guy riding a bike. And I just at the time didn't think it was cool to be wearing spandex and, uh, um, you know, to be wearing tights. And um, I was used to wearing baggy clothes and everything. So it's it just didn't feel right f- to me. Um, but it's very important. Um, I mean, it's 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 very important for both men and women and women. But um, I, I can only speak to it as a man. But I, I think it's it's very important to protect your junk (laughs) and uh you can save yourself a lot of agony by just investing in a good pair of of bike shorts um and we've we've experimented with various brands of bike shorts over the years and that's mainly we had sort of a progression where we started out just sort of buying the cheapest thing you could find. And then eventually we realized that this isn't really working out that well. Maybe I'll try something that's a little bit more expensive that looks a a little bit higher end. And so we would try a different brand and found, okay, this is actually a little better. It's maybe it's worth the extra money. You know, there's more, there's more padding in the chamois um and we kind of kept graduating to the next level and eventually we worked ourselves up to uh where we are now and um with the we'll we'll get into the specific brands that we use now in a minute but um i guess the point that i want to make is that if there's they're one of the the most important things that I think you could spend money on in cycling. If you, if you want to invest money in something that's going to make your rides more enjoyable, invest in a good pair of of bib shorts uh, or several good pairs of bib shorts so that you know you can always have clean pair to wear because uh, it's going to make a huge difference if you can find a pair of pair of bibs that fit you well and have adequate padding to support you on your rides it's going to make you more comfortable you know you'll get less saddle sores ideally you won't get any saddle sores and um yeah Uh, yeah and it's i hate to say this but the more expensive brands are better We've tried the least expensive, which is black bibs. And unfortunately, from my experience, they don't last very long. And the actual chamois itself, it's given me saddle sores, even on a one-hour indoor ride. And 
sometimes the chamois would, for some reason, come loose and it'll move around inside the fabric. So I would suggest trying, unfortunately, you know, this is going to break the bank for a lot of people who are new to cycling, but more high-end, high-quality bib shorts because it will make a difference when you're riding and you're sweating, especially in the summer. It makes a huge difference if you have a good pair of chamois underneath you. And I think another important point is to make sure the sizing is correct on your shorts because I used to always um, just just to give you sort of um, a a perspective, I guess, if there's any, there may not be that many guys out there that are my particular, you know, build, but just to give you an idea of like, you know, the sizing that would fit a particular sized person. Um, I'm 6'1 and about 170 pounds, so I'm slender but tall. Um, I, w I used to always get the large size uh, shorts because, you know, I figured while I'm tall, I want, I want to make sure that they're, they're long enough and everything. Um, and they felt, you know, I always thought that they felt tight enough, but then, you know, eventually Joy suggested, you know, I was having issues with still getting saddle sores sometimes. And Joy suggested, why don't you try a medium? Because, you know, because you're so slender, maybe you're actually a medium. And I had I had started wearing some medium size jerseys on on the top and they fit me fine so I was like okay let me try a pair of bibs that's a size medium and when I first tr put them on they felt really tight and I was like I don't know maybe this is too small but um it, as long as you can still move around in them and they're not you know suffocating you or something I think the the tighter the better. As long as you can still move in them, it's better to have them tight than loose um, because that way the chamois kind of stays in place better and it'll, it'll reduce the chance of saddle sores. So if you are f wondering what we use for bib shorts, um, for the brand, um, right now we are, right, we are using Velocio brand. Um, I can't remember. There's a couple of different um, iterations of this particular bib shorts. The um, signature is the one that we're using. Oh, signature. Yeah. And for the female listeners out there, I think you're going to like this because it has a call. They call it flyaway, which is an easier way to you, take a nature break without having to undress. And before switching to Velocio. I was using Lacalle bib shorts and there was no way for me to, you know, go to the bathroom without having to undress, unzip, take off base layers and all that. Whereas this, I just unzip my jersey and I just pull it down to do my business. Uh, so I highly suggest, I think Rafa also makes similar type of bibs. But I do suggest that you find jerseys, or sorry, you find bib shorts that have the ability for you to use the bathroom. It makes a huge difference um, when you're trying to go in and out of a porta potty because you know you don't want to. You're in like a, a fondo or a group ride or something. It makes a huge difference. Um, and one one more thing about the shorts, if you're if you're brand new to cycling and you're not really sure why, why would I buy a, a pair of the, so there's a difference between shorts and bib shorts. The bibs have suspender looking things that go over your shoulders. And if you're like me and when you first started out and you're wondering why would I wear these corny suspenders, I'll just wear like a regular pair of bike shorts that gets cut off at the waist. Um, in my opinion, you know, once once I went to the the bib shorts that have the suspenders, I never looked back because then I I realized right away 
there's a purpose behind these straps that go over your shoulders. It's to help keep the bibs in place, it helps keep the chamois in place better. Um, so yeah, I would highly recommend going with the actual bibs versus just regular shorts. Yeah, especially if you're doing long rides. I mean, if you're, um, if you're only doing rides of, you know, an hour or less on smooth road or, and you really have no intention of doing longer rides, you can probably get away with more different options. But assuming if you're, if you're listening to this podcast, you're probably someone who is either already, if you're not already a cyclist, if you're a new cyclist listening to this podcast, you probably have the intention to do longer rides at some point. And if you're going to be out there for, um, for several hours, you want to be as comfortable as possible. Trust us on that. So in addition to getting the right bib shorts and size for the bib shorts, I would also suggest investing on chamois cream. That's pretty important if you are, you know, riding for the first time a short 10-mile ride or you're doing a 50-mile ride. Definitely invest in that. Although some people have said that they don't use chamois cream and they're fine. I've never had that experience where I actually, I don't think I've ever ridden without chamois cream. I've always used one. And so I probably have experimented with multiple different types of brands of chamois cream. I started out with chamois butter. I think that's the most popular one. And I found that one. So this is my experience, my opinion on these brands. And you may have something totally different experience from me. But I, with the chamois butter, I found that it, when there's a lot of sweat, it almost, it's almost like washes it away. And so I get irritation. And then I switched to using D's nuts, which is for women. But the thing I didn't like about that is it has this strange tingling sensation when you're applying it. And I didn't really care for it that much. I used it for a number of months and they were fine, but I was still getting saddle sores from them. And I, so saddle sores is just, it, the, some people don't get it. I tend to get them once in a while if I'm riding a lot and I'm a pretty heavy sweater. So I think that might be the reason why I'm getting saddle sores is that the chamois cream that I use are, you know, are not, can't withstand the amount of sweat. And now I'm using Enzo's a buttonhole. I think that's what it's called. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Enzo's buttonhole tingle free. And it sounds really funny, but it's this small tub of cream and it's not in the tube. And I actually prefer it that way. And um, so far, so good. It's only been a few weeks that I've used it. So I really can't say much about the product yet. But so far, you know, I did get a saddle sore last week and that's probably because I use the black bib shorts on one of my endurance rides and I shouldn't have and then I got a saddle sore from that so I actually threw out the black bib shorts the three pairs that I had because I can't afford another saddle sore so uh, that's my experience with chamois creams uh, I haven't tried out that many different chamois creams I think I started off with um, Squirrel Saddle Butter. It's they also make. Um, I think the original product was Squirrel's Squirrel's Nut Butter, which was for like an anti-chafing um, cream for runners. I think, but they had like a, a saddle butter that was you know, made for cycling. I tried that. It it works okay, but um, it, yeah, similarly, it has that tingly feeling. Um, and I, I did find that it seemed to wear out during a long ride, um, where you're sweating a lot. So on long, 
long rides of say three hours or more, I would still start getting saddle sores. Um, since then I've switched over to actually just using Aquaphor, which is like a, uh, if you're not familiar with it, it's, um, kind of a healing ointment for, uh, for irritated skin. And I think it's also like mainly used as a skin barrier, um, in the medical field, they use it to help with bed sores. Hmm. Yeah. So it's a simple, you know, looks almost like Vaseline. Like it's really a simple, uh, cream and you just, you know, transparent cream. And, um, I tried using that and it actually works pretty well for me, both as a, a sort of a replacement for chamois cream to prevent myself from getting saddle sores. And in the event that I do get a saddle sore, it, it also works pretty well to help heal the saddle sores. So if you don't, if you don't want to use that necessarily as a chamois cream, you might consider having it on hand just in case you do get a saddle sore and you want to accelerate the healing process, um, you know, then I, I would recommend trying the, uh, aquaphor on, on the saddle sore to help it heal faster. I second that because I do have, I do get saddle sores, not very often, but when I do get them, I use aquaphor, shower up, you know, clean the area and apply the aquaphor at night. And it, it probably heals it within two days, sometimes a little bit longer. It depends. Um, just a word of warning though, it does stain your pants. So don't apply it before you head to work. Yeah. It's probably best to just apply it before you go to bed. I so I didn't even realize that it did that until I came home from work one day and I looked at my pants and I'm like, what is going on here? And so it, it's a little embarrassing when knowing that that was in my, that was on my pants. I had a little stain and nobody said anything. <laughs> so Aquaphor, definitely use that after saddle source if you get one or use it as a replacement chamois cream. So before we get into the next topic, um, I just want to quickly throw in one other thing that just came, came to mind that I think is important. Um, similar to how, uh, a well-fitting pair of bib shorts can, can help protect your junk. I think it's also important to have a saddle that fits you and, and also a bike. It, so if you're getting saddle sores, it could be several things causing it. It could be your, your short, your bike shorts. Um, it could be, you know, the, the chamois cream or lack of chamois cream that you're using. It could be, have something to do with your bike fit, which could be either the saddle itself or something else with your bike fit that's causing your sit bones to not be contacting the saddle in the right way. Um, so that's another area where I would recommend investing some extra money if, if you're new, even if, if you're new to cycling and, you know, you want to start off on the right foot, you know, spend the, uh, you know, bike fits are not, you know, they're not the, just like a good pair of bib shorts. They're not necessarily cheap, but if you get a, can get a good bike fit, you know, you're going to spend a few hundred dollars probably. Um, but I think it's worth it. Um, if you can find a, you know, bike shop that has a, a fitter who you, you know, you trust that, um, you know, that they're doing a thorough job in their, you know, evaluation of your position on the bike. And, um, it, 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 it'll be money well worth, um, spending to make sure that you're set up in a way on the bike based on your body type and your mobility and everything that you're set up in the right way so that the, uh, the right amount of weight and 
you know, it's being placed on your sit bones and that the saddle is the right shape for you. Cause there's all kinds of different saddles out there that, you know, if you, if you just search for saddles on the internet, you can come up with all kinds of varieties and how do you really know? It, it's almost impossible to, to buy a saddle online and, and guess to, to, to try to pick the right one for yourself you're going to end up having, if you do it that way, you're going to end up having to buy probably 10 different saddles before you find the one that, that works for you. So you could save yourself, you could probably save yourself some money in the long run by just going straight to the bike shop, getting a fit and having them suggest a saddle for you. Yeah. Don't be like Jason who bought <laughs> several yeah, I was that guy. saddles. I, I bought several saddles, just trying them out. And, you know, then, uh, you tried like the ISM, like the cutout saddle, right? Yeah. And I do think, I do think, especially for, for men, it's, it's different with everyone, but in my, in my experience, I've, I've had better experience with a saddle that has some type of a cutout or a relief channel, um, to take pressure off your perineum. Um, but you know, st- still, the best way to do it is to just get a, bu- a proper bike fit, have the the fitter recommend a um, a type of saddle for you, and you know I think uh, you'll save yourself a lot of you'll save yourself possibly money and 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 likely a lot of um, you know a lot of save yourself from a lot of discomfort of, you know, being uncomfortable on, on the bike. And it's not just a matter of, of comfort, um, for, especially for, for men, if you, if you're feeling numbness down there when you're on the bike, that's not good. Like you want to get that addressed sooner than later. Um, so, you know, just make sure that you're not having numbness. And if you are, then, you know, get a, get a, get a bike fit ASAP. Early last year, I had a lot of saddle sores when I ride gravel. And I already had, a, you know, a preferred saddle on my road bike. And I thought I liked the saddle I had on my gravel bike. But every time we did gravel, I would always get saddle sores, and I blamed it on the the bumps on the roads, and you know that could cause you know the the constant um, you know jostling around. I guess caused me to have saddle sores. But um, our coach slash bike fitter Andrea recommended that try using the same saddle that you have on your road bike, and so. I went to get, um, I'm using the Cell San Marco Aspeed, I think is the model. And I did purchase that saddle online because I was researching how to find the sit bone width. And one of the things that I did was I found foam. I sat in the foam and I kind of wiggle around a little bit and that's supposed to give some indentation of where your sit bones are and you measure at the center point of those indentations to get the sit bone width. I don't know how scientific that is, but that was from one of the things that I read on the internet. (laughs) And so I used that and it seemed to work because the Cell San Marco, uh, saddle I think they're the very few that sell narrow with saddles and it's worked for me and like I said I still get saddle sores but not as often as I used to in the past on the gravel bike and uh, so it's worked for me the saddle definitely is something to address if you are getting it often So in addition to 
Oh, actually, do you want to move on to Highlands, or do you think we should stop? We should continue with. I don't know. Do you want to? Um... Maybe we should talk about Highlands because right now it's we're at forty minutes. Okay. Yeah. Let's move on. Let's move on to Highlands, and then uh, we have a couple other um, tips for for beginners, but we can kind of sprinkle these into future episodes. Yeah, so Highlands Grand Fondo, which is an hour and a half from here, so fairly close. It's a New Jersey, so same distance, I think, to High Point where we did the hill climb time trial uh, early in, in early May. And uh, that's our first road Fondo ever. We were supposed to do Farmer's Daughter, but we decided not to do Farmer's Daughter because we had, we pretty much had Farmer's Daughter one week, the following week would be Mine Hill, and then the following week after that would be Highlands. So we decided to cut out Farmer's Daughter and, and do Highlands instead because we haven't really done a road event. Last year we did our first one, which was, well, actually we did a few last year, which was the Greylock Century Challenge and Tour of Cat Skills and the Greylock Hill Climb. So... We wanted to do more fondos this year because we were intrigued by the time segments. So I guess we'll talk about our latest thing before events, and that is fueling properly, and that's carb loading. Yeah, and we're still, we haven't perfected it yet. Uh, We're still sort of experimenting with what works the best for us, but... So um, maybe maybe we could talk about like what we did not do first before we talk about what we've done so far. And I know what you, we've what I've I can start. Us yeah, off you can start by saying that I thought carb loading was like just eating a lot of food the night before, and it doesn't matter. Like it could be something with carbs, but it doesn't matter. What as else long as is it has, as long as it has carbs, it right. doesn't matter what else is there. Right, and I guess there's a right way to do carb loading, and there's a wrong way to do carb loading. And then, for example, like pizza would be not a good carb loading fo- uh, meal because, well, it's got fats in there too, which you don't want. And and if you have vegetables in it, then you know you you have fiber. So I guess what we've learned is that to minimize as much as you can fats, fiber, what else? Yeah, I think it's mainly minimizing fats and and fiber. And you don't want to eat a ton of protein, but protein is fine, but you, you know, you don't want to you don't want protein to be like the your main source of calories the day before. Uh, the day before a race, you want to make your most of your calories to be coming from carbs. Um, and this is, I say this from a performance perspective only. Um, you know, if if you're if you have an event coming up and you know you're you're just doing it for fun and um, you're not particularly concerned with your performance it's probably not necessary to do any kind of specific carb load. Um, you know, you'll, you'll survive without doing it. We're just saying that we started experimenting with it this year, um, prior to races where we want to be performing at a high level. And so if you're going purely on a, from a performance standpoint, then, you know, carb loading just means that you want to be getting most of your calories the day before, um, the event from carbs if it's a if you're doing an event that's a really long race or like a stage race or something like that that's multiple days you might even consider carb loading for more than one day leading up to it but we haven't actually done one of those events ourselves so we can only talk about the one day carb load at this point and my favorite thing about this is that with carb loading is that I can have frosted flakes. 
Yeah, we found that. Um, and this so Jason's a really good l- label reader. <laughs> yeah, because so uh, um, when I went grocery shopping the day before, I forget when it was the first the first event that we. Uh, Mine Hill, I believe. Oh yeah, before Mine Hill, we decided we wanted to to try this, try a quote proper carb load where we would, you know, go kind of low fat, high carb, low fiber, you know, moderate protein kind of deal. And I was at the grocery store and searching for things that would fit that bill. And I got to the cereal aisle and I started looking at looking at stuff there and I'm um, reading the labels and I, f- I find that, you know, I mean, pretty much all cereals are going to be carb heavy, um, but you'd be surprised that some of them actually have a decent amount of fiber in there or some, some of them have a little fat and then quite a few of them actually have a decent amount of fiber, probably because they're... I think they're just trying to make it healthy. They 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 add it in there. It's not you know they they add it in there so that they can market the cereal as oh there is a uh, you know one serving of this has you know ten percent of your daily value of fiber or, you know so it's a it's a good marketing tool but um, if you're trying to carb load um, it, it may not necessarily be what you want. So uh, what I found was in my analysis of all the cereals frosted flakes was among the best um in terms of the macros i mean it's pretty much it's almost entirely carbs i think there's no fat if i remember correctly correctly there's either a zero fat or it's like a fraction of a gram of fat and um also very little fiber uh very little to no fiber it's pretty much straight carbs um, so we tried that the day before Mine Hill and we both felt great at Mine Hill. So, um, so we tried it again at, at, uh, the day before Highlands. Yeah. And my coach or our coach asked how I felt at the end of that. And I told her I had diamonds in my legs. And Jason was like, what does that even mean? Because I'm like, well, because diamonds are strong. So I felt my legs were really strong that day. Um, yeah, I, I think I'm. it could be, you know, a combination of the training and the fueling helps. And I've never felt like that before. I've never had my legs feel that good and never felt my lungs like I you know from a performance standpoint it's it I'm a firm believer that you know carbs are I know everybody talk is talking about carbs now about how to get in 90 grams of carbs or x number of carbs per hour I don't I don't know how many grams of carbs I take in um we do so for liquid calories we use high, scratch high carb mix and on race days i've tried six scoops of that seven scoops i mean and i felt like my for mine hill i felt like my stomach was a little off and but i still kept it at 7 at highlands and it felt fine then so seven scoops of the high carb mix. I also had gels with me. Uh, the goo stroop waffle. How how much um, water did you mix that seven scoops with, or so, what, so what size bottle was that? I found that well, I have a 950 milliliter water bottle that fits the down tube um, bottle cage there. And I have a 750 milliliter water bottle on my seat tube. So that's equivalent to, so 950 is about almost two bottles. 
and the 750 is about a little over one bottle so like a bottle and a half and I actually just had plain water on a 750 milliliter um, bottle because I wanted to make sure for Highlands I wanted to make sure that I was cool I didn't want to overheat so I just had regular water to spray on my back and on myself in general just to keep myself cool and so I actually did only seven scoops of high carb mix in the 950 milliliter bottle and how many hours does that last you like a couple uh, of hours or? I'm gonna say two hours that bottle okay. it wasn't that hot when we did Highlands it wasn't you know excruciatingly excruciatingly hot so I was able to last two hours or a little over two. Okay. Actually, it can last me over two hours. So I'm just trying to give some context because the seven scoops of scratch high carb mix is 400 calories, 100 grams of carbs. So if you're taking that in over a couple hours, it would be, you know, roughly 50 grams. Right. And I take. That you're getting from that. Of course, and, you could be also taking gels. Right. The gels every 45 minutes. And I alternate between, so when I'm riding and let's just say it's a race or a hard ride, gels and goo stroop waffle, because those are the only things that I could stomach and gels are every 45 minutes or, you know, take something in every 45 minutes, whether it's a gel or goo stroop waffle. And I had a mishap with the feed when I tried ordering the gels that I normally take, which is the first endurance liquid shot. And I'm not sure if they're doing away with that, but they were out of stock from the feed. And then I finally got it, got the box, opened it, and it was a completely different product they sent me called Bonk Breakers. And so I had to go to the First Endurance website, order that, pay an extra $20 to ship it quickly. And of course, it arrives Saturday late afternoon and we were already in New Jersey. So I didn't get it. So I wound up actually the day prior or two days prior to the Fondo, I ordered... Never second. Never second. Never second. And I did not come in second, by the way. So never second gels. And that worked well. I actually really liked that. I was afraid because that was the first time I've ever tried never second gels. And I remembered we met up with our friend Sandy there. And I said to her, I know this is not a good, like this is not a good idea to try something new on the day of an event, but I'm trying something new on the day of the event. And it, it was fine because I didn't have any gut issues or anything. So that was my fueling during the race and before the race was, you know, just other carbs, which, oh, sushi. That's right. We had sushi. Yeah. That's another thing that we like to eat as a, our, for our, usually for our dinner the day before a, a race. A lot of people do not recommend sushi because you can totally, you can get, you know, you can get really sick from it, but we have a place that we go to, to have, to have our sushi. Yeah. So what we would say on that is you probably don't want to get sushi, sh sushi from a new place that you've never been to before. Or like some, um, you don't want to get it randomly, but if in our case, we were getting it from our favorite, our favorite restaurant that's, you know, right here in town. And we, we go there all the time and, um, never had any issue with them. So, you know, we're pretty, you know, trusting that, uh, we're going to have no issues. And I think at this point, our stomachs are pretty well adapted to, to raw fish because we've been eating sushi probably once a week for the last every five, Friday night. That's last, our probably five years. Yeah. That's our dinner every Friday night sushi. So I guess we could talk about the segments for the Fondo, right? 60 miles, something 5,000 something feet of elevation gain yeah this was a metric century so over 5,000 feet of gain and three time segments 
You want to go ahead and talk about this, the first segment? Um, oh yeah. So the first segment was, uh, I don't remember the, the, the stats on it, but it's, I think it was a, it was a, a moderate grade climb of, was it like three miles, four miles? I think it, like well, that? okay. From what I wrote down, 4.8 miles. I actually have a custom alert oh, okay. to my Wahoo that tells me like half a mile before the segment starts. So yeah, it's 4.8 miles. I don't remember what the average grade was, but it wasn't steep. And Andrea said that, you know, we need to find a group to draft with. Okay. I'm going to actually let you talk more about this one um, just because I'll just say quickly that um, I I didn't last very long on the first segment. I was I was not feeling good that day, not from I wasn't ill or anything, but um, I was dealing with um, sort of a hip injury that was a, an aftermath of the crash I had at at the Mine Hill race. Um, and it's what it actually was, was a, um, a muscle spasm in my glute that's kind of goes along the side of, you know, the, the side of the hip. And so I was feeling sharp pain in that area, you know, just walking around and, um, you know, off the bike, I was limping around and everything really didn't feel too, too hot. Um, on the bike, I was able to ride, but, um, in the week leading up to Highlands, I was, um, able to ride, but with a little bit of pain in the hip while riding. But on the morning of the Highlands event, while I was warming up, um, my hip just didn't feel too good. It was, you know, pro probably felt a little worse than it had during the week. And, and I did tell him. I did and, say to him, don't do this. Yeah, and, and, and Joy said, you know, maybe you shouldn't, you probably shouldn't be doing this. And, but, you know, I have, I, I can be stubborn. And, um, you know, when I set my mind to do something and planned on doing it, um, you know, I I felt like I was committed to it mentally. And I decided to, to go ahead and, and try the event. And I... I sort of used the excuse that um, that oh I can always stop you know I'll I'll just I'll start off see, see if the leg see if the hip loosens up as we get going and then if it doesn't you know I can just stop and and, and turn around and you know go back and that's what I sort of told myself to you know convince myself that it was or validate that it was okay to, to, to try riding in this event. Um, but I sort of knew in the back of my mind that I was going to probably push through it, even if I wasn't feeling good. Um, cause that's just, that's just what happens sometimes. And so anyway, um, I wasn't, I wasn't feeling good, particularly at the beginning of the ride. And this first segment came up with, I think it was only like a mile and a half after the start of the, of the event. So, um, the hip wasn't feeling good at that point. I was having, really having trouble turning the legs over and, and producing power. So I found out pretty quickly, uh, at the beginning of the first segment, I was trying to follow Joy, um, and just kind of use her as a pacer but I couldn't keep up and I just dropped back, um, you know, doing, uh, I was doing probably, uh, 40 to 50 Watts low, lower than my threshold. And it felt like I was doing threshold. Um, so I pretty much just did whatever I could on that first segment and just regrouped with the, the folks we were riding with afterwards. So I'll, I'll pass it on to Joy to to tell you about what she did for that segment. Yeah, when I, um, even before the segment started, we, well, before that, we um, met up with a group of people, mainly um, our friend Sandy has um, friends who were doing this event also. 
So we met up with them and rode with them. And it was nice because they said, we're going to, you know, we're just going to start at the very back and just pass people along the way when the segment starts. So we held back and, uh, you know, kind of took it easy, just kind of got to know each other because I've never met them before. This is my first time meeting them. And then all of a sudden, there was this group that were flying past, that flew past us, and Sandy was, you know, hopped onto their wheel. And I was caught off guard because, you know, I, I it didn't really, the segment hadn't started yet. So I um, tried to, to hang on to their wheel, try to catch up to them because my reaction, my reaction was not quick enough to respond to that. So I didn't really uh, hang on to their wheel, but I did the best that I could to on that segment. My legs felt really good. I felt really good. And, uh, you know, I was passing people and that made me feel really good. There was at one point where there was a flat section or semi-flat section where I started to get kind of low in the arrow and I was slotting into the draft of people ahead of me and then slotting out of it. So I used them to kind of help me slingshot forward. But then I got caught behind a big group of guys. I think they were men, but I got caught behind them and there was a big group of them and I couldn't really get around them. I didn't want to go on the left side of the road because the road is open to traffic. And there were cars that were coming in the opposite direction. So I didn't really want to go to the left side of the road. And so, you know, I caught, I got caught behind those guys. And then finally I saw an opening, went through the opening and then kept pedaling. Eventually I did see Sandy. Um, and I was so cl I was using her as a carrot, but I didn't want to get too close to her yet because when I looked down, at my Wahoo, um, I had the distance, the lap distance up, and I saw, okay, it's still, you know, we still have uh, two more miles or so left, and so it's not, you know, I might as well just keep an eye on her. And I never really caught up to her, and I finished in 19 minutes. I don't have the segment time up, but I, I finished 19 minutes and something seconds, and not too far off from, from Sandy, but, you know, wish I could... I wish I could have gone a little harder on it. But my legs, you know, it was promising because my legs felt really good. And the fact that I was, you know, slightly behind her, I was excited, you know, to know that I could just, you know, I could keep up with, with a group. They stopped and waited for everybody else to come up, to come by so that the group can regroup again. So that was really nice. And so we were able to to ride together until the second segment, which was a lot of fun. Yeah, the second segment was kind of the highlight of... Uh, it, it, the second segment was kind of the highlight of the ride for me, I think, because it was a new experience. Um, it was a, I think, five and a half mile stretch of rolling terrain you know, gent gentle rolling terrain, so not completely flat, but not, you know, slight uphills, slight downhills, and some flats. And shortly before that segment started, the group collectively decided... What? He thought? Yeah. Sorry. Just realized my microphone is... Okay. Um, shortly before the se second segment started, the group we were riding with collectively decided to attack that one as a team in a, you know, in a pace line. Um, so we decided, um, or I should say they decided, and then I kind of just followed along. Um, they decided they were going to do 30 second pulls at the front and, you know, form a pace line so that you know, the person at the front does goes hard for 30 seconds. They peel off to their left. The next person comes around to the front. And then, you know, as the person that peels off just kind of drifts, you know, toward the back of the group and then slots back in behind the last person. 
um, and you just kind of keep going in a rotation like that. So this was our first time having the opportunity to do something like that, especially with, um, you know, with multiple riders. You know, we had, um, since most of the time we end up riding with just the two of us, there's been times where we, you know, would trade pulls at, in front of each other, but they're typically longer pulls and we're not doing this sort of constant rotation. Um, so this, this whole concept was kind of new and interesting to, I think to both of us. And it was, it was really fun and it kind of got me excited. Um, and I was like, all of a sudden I was enthusiastic about, um, trying to, to go a little hard on this segment and see if I still felt like my legs were not there, um, that day, but I was starting to feel definitely better by the time we got to the second segment, I was feeling definitely better than the first segment, just cause my hip was a little loosened, more loosened up at that point. And so I decided I was going to jump into this pace line and see if I could contribute at least a few pulls, um, to the team effort because these folks we were riding with were kind enough to pull me along pretty much all day, all day, um, outside of the segment races. Uh, you know, I did minimal work in that group. Um, and so, yeah, uh, Joy, what were your, um, I know you were pretty excited about doing the pace line also, but what did, what are your specific thoughts about it? So the first part, um, so obviously it's the first time that we've both done it. And I hopped on to, I was, I hopped onto the front the first time. And so that was kind of cool. I was the first person to go 30 second pulls. I didn't know how hard to go, but 30 seconds, I could go pretty hard in 30 seconds and recover in the draft. So I went, I went kind of hard just to see how the group was going to take it. And they went, you know, there's this woman named Annie who's, there are two women who were really, I mean, the, there were a lot of them who were pretty strong. Um, but Annie was behind me and she was able to, you know, still keep up um, from my measly whatever watts I was doing and I peeled off she did her pull she peeled off but then nobody came through and so yeah it was a little I want to say not disorganized but I, we, I think it was you know people didn't really weren't sure exactly what to do but eventually once we got rolling we did such a it was such it was just such a cool thing to be a part of because just how fast you go on the pace line when you're rotating like that. I think our average speed was 20 or so miles per hour. And we were just rolling past people. I think it was faster than that, but we were rolling past people and it was just a, such a cool thing to experience being in that. Cause we've never done it before first time. So I called it a team time trial. Yeah, and I learned a couple things from it. Um, obviously, when you're when you're the person at the back, the further back you are in in the in the line, the more of a draft you get hypothetically. But you have to be careful when you're, especially when you're the person at the back. You have to be real careful about not falling off of the wheel in front of you, because if you start to drift off of their wheel, it's kind you have to really accelerate to get back on because the the group that you just lost contact with is moving fast. So in order for you to catch back up to them, if 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 a gap forms to catch back up to them, you have to, you know, pretty much do zone five power or something like that just to just to get back on. So you have to you have to be careful about not falling off the back. Yeah, and it's easy, too, because you actually would just would have to do some form of burst. You know, you peel off, so you're kind of coasting a little bit. It's kind of spinning your legs, and then once the last person 
gets ahead of you, you sort of have to do this sprint to hop onto their wheel and hold their wheel. So you get like, it's like 30 seconds of, I say, you know, a hard effort to be able to hang on to a group, maybe a less, maybe less than that, to hang on to the group and sit there comfortably for, you know, a minute or two. Yeah, and then when you're the second person in line and you're behind the person that's pulling, you're not getting, you're getting some draft. You're, obvi- you're obviously getting, you're, you're having to do less power than the person that's pulling, but because they're going pretty hard, you still have to go reasonably hard yourself. You, you're not just recovering. It's almost like you're starting to ramp up when you're second in line, you, you're starting to ramp up, preparing to do your pull. At one point during the second segment, when we were doing this this pace line, there was a section of the segment that went, it was like a downhill swooping turn, and Joy was pulling at the front. And, you know, if for those of you who haven't had a chance to ride with her, she loves descending. And she loves going fast around these um, swooping, somewhat sharp turns, descending. And she almost dropped the the whole pace line down this descent because no one wanted to go down it as fast as she did. So she actually gapped all of us on this this little descent. Yeah, I did not. Re- I didn't realize that I did until I looked back and I was like, oh my god, there's a huge gap from between me and the group so i i did have to ease up to wait for them to continue pulling but yeah that was um and and these were were you know, some some of the some of the ladies we were riding with were you know probably super strong yeah they're stronger riders than us but they're probably thinking um this is a fondo and i'm not trying to kill myself and then here's joy she's just like bombing it down this descent it, it, it wasn't really a full descent it was like a swooping it was, goes down and then it went up again but I guess I didn't realize that you know I, I didn't realize that I was going too hard on it so I didn't realize that until now actually well until the time I did when I looked back but I forgot about that yeah I think it's just that everyone else was you know coasting and and probably feathering the brakes while Joy's you know, pedaling 300 watts going or <laughs> probably in the, uh, probably in the, uh, the 10 tooth, you know, go- going hard down this, uh, this hill anyway. That's too funny. So segment three is an interesting one because there were a series of steep climbs prior to hitting that third segment and I actually when I saw the profile for the third segment I got excited because it ends in a descent so um, I thought oh this is perfect this is like this is something that I would enjoy because that means going hard for whatever however many miles and then just you know recover on the descents sort of recover on the descents it was like two miles, right? Yeah, I think so. And it was kind of exposed. The uh, first part of the climb was a little bit more exposed. And I always get nervous about being out in the sun because I know that I overheat. And so I went reasonably hard. I didn't think I went, you know, I emptied a tank on it at all. And then I didn't realize, oh, there's actually shade on the other side. So, yeah, that was a fun segment because it was short. There was a climb. It descended, and there was another climb, and then you descend again. And uh, for that one, I think I finished 9 minutes and 49 seconds. I I remember that one. Yeah, I I remember I was I was riding with with Joy when the segment started and I I was using her as a carrot to, to chase um, to see if I could keep up with her on this one, unlike the first segment. 
and I, I wasn't totally able to keep up with her, but um, she, I kept her in, in my sight, and I felt a lot better on the third segment than I did the first segment. I don't remember exactly what kind of power I was doing, um, but I think I was able to do closer to threshold power on this one. And after after it goes downhill, there's it kind of goes back up a little ramp at the very end. And I was able to put out some decent power going up that ramp. Um, so the, the legs were definitely better on the second segment and the the third segment um, than they than they were on the first segment. So overall, it was a it was a pretty fun experience being able to ride with a group and kind of using the group to strategize some of the segments. It was again, it was our first time riding with a group. Uh, on time segments. So I definitely see the benefit of of drafting and working as a team on these segments, which would probably not play into our favor on the future segments that future fondos that we're doing because you know we don't really know anyone who's doing the fondos that we're going to register for. Um, is that all you? Do you have anything else to say about the overall experience? Uh, it was fun, and I, I we met great people, and it helped. It was humbling to know that, you know, there are, we're younger than a lot of the the women and, and men that we rode with, but they are so much stronger. <laughs> so it's humbling. To, to see that yeah there's there's really some uh some strong riders out there of of all ages and um you know we're we're amazed by by it when we go to some of these events you know how many how many strong riders there are and we got a chance to ride with some of them in this uh this fondo so that was really cool and um, you know, I was thankful that they they were all willing to, you know, to pull me along and just let me sit there at the back, you know, nursing my my injury. And um, yeah, again, it probably it was probably not the logical decision to for me to ride in this fondo. Um, we are. We're recording this podcast a few weeks after it happened, and I am just now starting to get back to 100% uh, healthy uh, from my injury. And I think riding in in this event did set me back probably by – it's hard to quantify um, how much it set me back, but if I had to guess, it probably costed me uh, you know, another week or so of recovery that I probably could have recovered a, a week faster if I didn't, if I hadn't done it. Cause I, I was really in uh, pretty bad shape after we finished. Um, I was, uh, I, you know, I was okay on the bike. There was some pain, um, but it was off the bike. As soon as I got off the bike, you know, I was really limping, like I could barely walk. Um, and, uh, yeah, so it, it just, it probably wasn't the right decision, but I, I made the decision to ride it with my heart and not my brain. And, you know, that's on me. So, you know, I don't want anyone to, to feel sorry for me that I sort of struggled through this, this event um, in pain because, you know, that was my decision to, to do it. I, I knew it was going to be a struggle and I just decided to do it anyway. Um, I forgot to mention my results. Oh yeah. That. Why don't you talk about that? Uh, so, uh, when, once we crossed the finish line, I, um, 
you know, we got changed and everything. And I, they started calling the, uh, so we did the media route and there's, so that's the medium, uh, like metric century. And then they had the grand route, which is a hundred miles. And then the piccolo route, which is the shorter one, which I, I think was 40 miles, but they started calling the 40 mile, uh, winners or the podium people who podiumed it. And I was waiting to see when they're going to, you know, call the, the media people. <laughs> and I decided, oh, let me take a look to see. I, I asked, I believe I asked the, uh, I think he was a, one of the race organizers. I asked him where we would find the results. And he said to go on the website. So I did. And I was pleased to see that I got third in my age group and 10th female. So I was like, really, I was pretty thrilled, just like I was at Mine Hill, pretty thrilled with that result. Um, I felt like I, har I, I rode hard. And the coolest thing was that not only my results, but the results of the women in our group. So Annie, the woman who was behind me at the, our team time trial or slash pace line, she got, I think she got seventh female first in her age group. Valerie got sixth female first in her age group. Lisa, who got first in her age group and I can't remember what her overall placement was but that was such a cool thing to experience that most of us almost podiumed it or most of us podiumed it uh, Sandy unfortunately had to pull out because she had two flats uh, her front and rear tire flatted so uh, she had to pull out from that. Otherwise, she would have won her age group also. And had Jason been feeling 100%, I think he definitely, I think he would have podiumed it or close to top or maybe even top 10 result. Yeah, it's, it's hard to say. I don't, offhand, I don't remember. Um I don't remember what the times were of the you know, the different placements in my age group, but um, but yeah, it was it was a fun experience for me. I there's a part of me that still doesn't regret doing it, um, even though I would say at this moment right now I uh, I'm sort of fifty fifty on it. it. There's a part of me that is still glad that I did it because it was there were there were good things about that experience that I wouldn't have I wouldn't have those memories if I hadn't participated um and then on the flip side it did set my my recovery back some so I regret it from that standpoint um but you know all in all I don't I, I still don't know if I if I'd say that I I really regret doing it it, it was it was fun and it's a good memory. That and we didn't really have any events or races lined up after Highlands anyway. So I think, you know, either way it, you know, there was some benefit to it in your fitness, probably more. It hurt you because of the recovery part, but it was also, you know, we didn't have anything planned. So um, after Highlands, so you know, you can't, you didn't really, you know, you don't really miss out on a lot of training after Highlands. Yeah. I'll probably be a little bit short on, on volume heading, heading into the Vermont Grand Fondo, which is our next one. Um, you know, and that's another somewhat of a long ride. Um, so I'm a little short on volume, but it just, just did a, a ride today with some intensity and felt great. So I'm, I'm feeling good on shorter rides. So now it's just a matter of, I, I got to get a little more volume in my system before Vermont. All right. I think that's it, right? 
Yeah, I think so. All right. Well, so thank you for listening to today's episode, everybody. If you enjoyed it, please follow, subscribe, rate, like, and so on to help this podcast grow. You can follow us on Instagram at Join Jason Rides with no space in between, YouTube at Joy and Jason Rides with space be- in between Joy and Jason, and Strava. Jason's uh, profile is under Jason Pyers. Mine is J- Joy Pyers. And I'll link all of that in the show notes below. As always, don't forget to enjoy the ride.